Hello, Boston. I wish I could be there with you. I'm in a hotel room um, in another meeting. I just wanted to get on for those of you that haven't met me in person. I'm Erica Medley. I'm a geologist with the RMC. Previous to that, I was with Portland for several years. And then, oh, excuse me. Okay. Um, so I'm going to turn off my camera for the presentation, but I just wanted to get on to say hello. And uh, you guys tell me if you can't hear me or something, because it's hard for me to tell. But um, I'm going to be talking about Foster Dam and the spillway erosion site characterization case history. So our learning objectives for this presentation are to characterize the site geology using all of the available information that you have. I think sometimes there's a lot more you can get out of the original documentation that they've done. It's really impressive what some of the geologists did in like the 50s and 60s times. Um, so get as much as you can out of that. And then how do you get some in situ data when you need it to inform a specific failure mode. And to the right here is a really cool photo of columnar jointed basalt from the Foster Dam site during original construction. Um, so that's really a common way that when basalt cools, it contracts and forms these really cool columns. Okay, and so there's a couple different rock units that we're going to look at for the risk assessment because we're assessing both the spillway on the chute section and then the spilling basin at the bottom. And there's two different rock units that, that we need to assess the erodibility of. So first I'll just give a brief um, overview of the project, where it is. I'll talk about the geology, and then I'll get into our targeted field exploration program for the slow erosion failure mode. Um, and then I'm not really going to go into the risk assessment where it plots on the FN chart, but I'll talk about how the results that we get from slow erodibility feed into our quantitative risk assessment for one of the failure modes. And then we'll have a little bit of time for questions if I'm fast enough. Um, so briefly here, we're looking at Foster Dam. It's located in Oregon in the Willamette Valley. Um, so this is the whole Willamette Valley basin that you can see in this photo. And Foster Dam feeds into the main stem Willamette just south of Albany. So um, the way we operate in Oregon is based on the precipitation patterns. So we keep the dams nearly full in the summer. Foster is a re-reg dam for Green Peter. So it basically is, it doesn't fluctuate as much as some of the other ones, but maybe like 30 feet throughout the, the year annually. And it maintains a elevation so that Green Peter Dam can generate hydropower. Um, I'm going to keep going here. So this gives, shows you the project features. We've got the, the main embankment uh, um, to the right of the spillway. Then we have a concrete dam. Some of the monoliths are kind of um, hidden in the embankment section, but the concrete dam has a spillway with four caner gates. Um, then we have pen, two pen stocks that come down to the powerhouse and we generate some power at Foster Dam as well as computer. And then we have a long wing dam that sits on some old Pleistocene terraces off to the left. Okay, so let's get into the geology a little bit. Foster is in the lower foothills of the central Cascade Range. Um, it's near the transition between really deeply incised stream valleys um, in the Cascades, and it's really just right as you're entering the Willamette Valley and things start to, to flatten out. It's right on the margin. So it consists of Eocene to Miocene, volcanic classic rocks of the Mahema Formation, um, and then it, there's also a foster basalt, um, which is really where the pen stocks come through. But we're going to be focusing on the volcanoclastic rocks that make up the, the spillway foundation. So they're also called the Wiley Creek Tuff. Um, and this is um, some mapping that the state has done of the area. I'm going to keep going. So looking, zooming in on our site-specific geology here. Um, 
So we're in this picture, we're looking at upstream. And so we sit on this series of an ashy tuff, which is very, very thin, a sandy tuff unit, and a lapilli tuff unit. And they all generally have this sort of upstream 10-ish degree dip. And that overall um, structure of the foundation informs the eye angle of the rock. So that would be your 10 degrees when you sort of zoom out and look at the overall dip of the rock. And that information is what you would give to the structural engineers that are, are doing some of the modeling of the monolith. Okay, so some of the rock is really susceptible from flaking. We get a lot of that information from the original logs that talk about the ashy tuff. They did a lot of testing during construction of um, looking at how if we wet and dry the rock repeated cycles, um, how much is this rock sort of breaking up into pieces and eroding. So there were some concerns about the ashy tuff during construction. Nevertheless, it does form the foundation of at least a couple of the monoliths. Um, so let's keep going here. So Foster, built in the 60s, we actually do have some color construction photos, which are super cool. Um, and so one of the things that I did for the site characterization is really go through in detail and get as much information as you can from all these construction photos. And you can actually start mapping out some of the joint sets and uh, figure out what they're doing in their construction sequence. And so for this monolith too, you can see in the previous photo, it dips way down for um, monolith one and two. They excavated a significant portion of the foundation to essentially get down to butter rock and to remove a lot of the sheared zones. As it turns out, um, a lot of dams, a lot of good locations for dams are where you have a giant fault. And um, Foster is the same case where we have a big shear band, which I'll show also later, but some of it was removed and there's a quite an irregular foundation that, that forms each of these monoliths. <clears throat> so I was able to identify where the sandy tough and the pulley tough contact is, that's this red line. And then once we get much, much deeper, the, the pulley tough is much better quality um, in depth. So we also identified and correlated this to later once we did all of the boring, we have this really much lower section of RQD sandy tough at the very top of that unit. Okay. So this is just another example of looking at the construction photos. I was able to determine that the bedding planes are really pretty continuous. Um, and we also identified one of the other joint sets along the walls. So this is a map showing the foundation of the spillway and the spilling basin. I've marked out where the monoliths are. So to the left over here, we are downstream. This area is the spilling basin area. And we started mapping out all of the different joint sets. And um, what are some of the angles? How continuous are they? And this all plays into the qualitative assessment when you get into your risk assessment because when you're modeling failure of one of these monoliths after you erode a lot of the rock, you have to assume how long and continuous are these side planes. Could it possibly be the entire length of your monolith that this thing could really slide out on some of these release planes? And so I think using all of the original construction data can be really useful and really important. And um, it's impressive the way some people are able to use the data that we already have. And so when you're making your film investigation plan, make sure that it's informed by, by the data you already have. And then this shear zone is the one I pointed out where we did some lower excavations in this monolith two to remove some of that material. Um, and some of it is left in place under three and four. Okay, so using some of that um, original data, we mapped out some of the joint sets. Um, this is a plot using the program DIPS, which we have available 
on the app portal. It's very just easy and uh, useful software. It can do some kind of basic kinematic analysis as well if you're wondering if you have release plans and things like that. But it's a pretty easy program to use and it allowed us to um, visually look at these different joint sets. And then I also put in the shear you can see here that crosses. And the cool thing too is that this um, so it matches the same orientation. You can kind of look at it straight north is towards the right abutment. So straight north is towards the right abutment. And this is that shear plane. So you can actually kind of visually um, visually look at this. So how do we, that's, that's mostly data we had, although I did include the joints from the drilling. But how do we move towards field investigation? Because we have these out of the phase one risk assessment, like Tom was talking about, we determine we have potential risk with this filling basin and the spillway chute. Um, but we have a lot of uncertainty associated with that. And some of that uncertainty comes from how erodible is the rock. Um, also, we need other details of the rock, like the elastic modulus and things that feed into the structural modeling side. Um, but I'm mostly going to focus on how do you come up with your erodibility index and how that informs your risk assessment. So it's challenging, right, because we've now built the dam and we want to know the in situ properties of the rock. And we don't have that information from original construction data. We have a little bit, but it, we needed more. So we have these, these different failure modes. How do we get at the rock? Well. We decide that we're going to do this drilling program through the spillway gallery. So there's this drainage gallery in the bottom of the concrete dam. Um, and you can go through the concrete slab and we can get some information also on the concrete that will be useful for the structural modeling. And then we can get into these different layers of the rock. Um, and so this was our plan to do four different holes. So not very deep, but getting into the lapilli tuff on a, on a couple. Um, and so, how do we how do we get equipment in there? It was challenging because you're working in a very very small area, but we used our in-house drill crew that we have in Mobile District. They still have a couple of drill drill crews and and rigs. They have this really cool little electric rig you can see in this photo. Um, and so we did PQ core 3.3 inches. We took 18 days to do those four borings. Um, there were lots of challenges initially. Um, there were some environmental considerations that we had to bring up because they didn't have some of the proper spill gear. And you need to think about the perception if you have, you know, really dirty water that eventually is draining out downstream. And so we thought about things like that. And then also we thought about a lot of our joint sets are nearly vertical, very close to vertical. So we try to do drill at a little bit of an angle with each of the holes. Because then if you have a vertical joint set, you don't have, you're not just going to slide right along it. You're going to cut across at a little bit of an angle. And then you can just correct the orientations afterwards. Um, based on, on the angle that you drilled at. <laughs> so we also offset these PQ cores and we got some six inch diameter concrete cores. Um, you can see there is some really large size aggregates. Um, and so we got a lot of good information and we also did some unconfined compressive strength testing of the, the concrete as well. So one thing I'll talk about a little bit later is the length of these cores and how that affects things like your rock quality density, um, which is based on a measured length, right? But your standard run length might be more like five feet. In this case, because of our limit up here at the top, we really only could do two foot runs. Okay, so the other thing I would say if you're doing any kind of field exploration that involves drilling into rock, then I personally would never drill into rock without doing an optical televiewer log. 
because you get tons of information from that. And once you've paid to drill that hole, it's fairly inexpensive um, and very quick and pretty easy for these guys to come in. It's usually a sub contractor to the main, and they come in and they send down this this probe. Um, and the probe can do various various different things. You can do this optical televiewer logging like you did here. It can do acoustic where it looks more voids. Um, and you can also do some geophysical um, probes as well if you're looking for that kind of data. <clears throat> and so um, the probe, the, you get basically all of the different joint sets slash bedding planes mapped out and you get this 3D view of your hole. So this is the core and then this is unraveling that 3D picture. Um, and so the results are pretty cool and it really does identify some things where you, you may have some uh, breaks due to drilling and then maybe you can look at the televiewer and say, oh, you know, that really was intact and it got broken from the drilling rather than being just a natural fracture. So we notice we have a lot of this carbonate banding and it's usually there are bedding planes where carbonate has secondary come in and infilled um, as a precipitate mineral there. Um, and we also have just like really good quality rock and high water returns, which indicated that there weren't a lot of voids and open bedding planes. So the kind of testing that we did um, to get the data we needed, we did some direct shear testing. So we did both natural fractures and then we did some smooth spawn. I recommend doing natural fractures as much as possible because the data were a little bit different from smooth spawn and we ended up kind of throwing out those data because the natural fractures were judged to be much more accurate. Um, it just sometimes you don't have enough to do as many tests as you like, so you do both, which is is what happened here. And then unconfined compressive strength testing, that's the main parameter that we use to inform the erodibility index out of this study. Um, and then we also did some, some unit weight testing. It's just low cost and confirmed um, kind of the original construction data. So here's a picture of the OTV logging. Um, Pretty cool, this guy came in, I would say in a couple hours, did all four holes and he was out of there and you get, you get a little report. Um, okay, I'm gonna keep going. So this is us kind of piecing together some of those optical log pictures, looking at it with our um, pictures of some of the runs and correlating across some of these fractures it's kind of hard to do on this scale because um, these are far apart. <laughs> these are several, um, maybe like a couple hundred feet apart. So, but um, that can kind of give you an idea of the continuity of some of your features as well. Okay, now I'm gonna get into how we use that data that we collected in the field to inform our erodibility analysis. So from best practices and USDA, um, Annandale, um, we use this erodibility um, formula. So this is the KH, which are, is our erodibility index, and it's informed by the mass strength number, the block size, the discontinuity bond shear strength number, and the relative ground structure number. I'm going to run through, not in a ton of detail, but you guys will have this as um, a reference if you want, but it's in our best practices manual, and um, there's many, many good examples of, of people running through this. So um, we wanted to look at all the different subunits of the, the tuft. So we have that upper ashy tuft that's discontinuous, and then we have a sandy tuft and a lapilli tuft. And so these were our results from the unconfined compressive strength testing. I just looked at the median. I also looked at some of the results from one of the original design memorandum. Um, that had some unconfined compressive strength tests, 
but they were on NX cores. So we waited a little bit, which are the smaller, say like two inch diameter cores that they sometimes do for original construction. So we waited a little more heavily on the the more modern um, data, but we did compare against each other just to see um, because we actually didn't have any data for the ASCII test. All of the samples were too um, broken up and they weren't long enough to test for unconfined compressive strength. So we did have to go with the original um, DM values for that. And then we just did one standard deviation to kind of get a range. So we, whenever we're doing these risk analyses, we try to look at parameters that might be sensitive or useful for the assessment probabilistically. So you have an uncertainty and everything and you get, you develop a range of your results. Um, so then for the KB, that is your block size number, it's your RQD over your joint set number. And so like I said, we had these limited run lengths and mechanical breakages, breakages were considered. Um, and then we also had some data from the original boring where we actually looked into they call out a lot of joints and you can start measuring the spacings between them on some of the original logs. So we did that as well. Um, on the next slide, I'll talk about the JN number, but these were our, our RQDs. Um, so very low for the ASHI test. Could have some pretty broken up material at the surface for a couple of those monoliths. And then as you get deeper, this Lapilli tough and the lower Sandy tough nearly 100% RQD, very good quality rock as you get deeper. Okay, so for the JN, um, we, there's this, basically just this table comes from uh, Annandale and, and USDA, um, and you can use this and your analysis to say, okay, we have three joint sets and a random, which is the bedding plane. So that's what we went with, 3.34 for the JN. Okay, so those were our results when we divide our QD um, by the JN for KD. Okay, and then we look at the discontinuity bond shear strength, and again, you use this table to inform it, and so what we said here was we have tight joints, um, and they are between rough, irregular, undulating to smooth and undulating. And these photos were really helpful in kind of looking at some of those joint surfaces. Um, okay, and then the JA is your joint alteration number. So for Katie, we're going to divide our JR from the previous table by JA, our joint alteration number. Um, so it represents the degree of alteration of the materials that form the faces of the discontinuities. So based on observation from pre-construction borings and the 2018 borings and optical logs, we came up with a best, a best estimate of one. Um, and then we also gave it a little bit of a range just to look at things probabilistically. Okay, so for the ground structure number, and it's all these just get multiplied together to form your cage. So it's pretty easy, easy math that um, any geologist can do. Um, so this basically informs the orientation with respect to flow of your joints. So this diagram is good on the left because it shows if your um, rocks are dipping upstream, that's um, an unfavorable orientation or dipping away from flow. And they so use this table just like the other tables and figure out what that, what that number is gonna be. And you may have, uh, you're going to have a different JS number for your spillway chute versus your stilling basin because your orientation with respect to flow changes. So you need to come up with erodibility indices that are different for both of those. So this is what we came up with. Um, as an example, we look at the different joint sets each 
and then we come up with the JS, and then we use the one that's the lowest because that's going to be the worst one with respect to flow. Okay, so these are the results of our roadability analysis. Um, you kind of come up with these indices or numbers on erodibility, and then it's like, okay, what does this mean? We've got a 360 erodibility, and is that good or is that bad? Um, and in the spilling basin, we just have the lapilli test, and so we're, we're a little bit higher. But how do we use these numbers? What do they mean? Um, I'm going to quickly look at this failure mode progression, and then I'll talk about how that plays in. So going through these, A, you have your normal condition. B, you lose your stilling basin slab because maybe there were some voids under it. And you can use your characterization to help inform this too. Do you possibly have voids in the rock or could a void be formed where you can get some water underneath and um, develop some stagnation pressure? And at some flow, you lose that slab. And then in uh, C, plunge pool forms, and you start to scour. And then in D, your hole deepens to the point where it undermines the edge of the monolith. So from our calculations, I think it was something like once you, you only have to lose something like 10 feet of that, and this monolith has an overturning issue. So it's not that significant, but um, that leads to failure. Okay. So here's our event tree for this spillway monolith failure. We have some kind of flood event, and then the spilling basin slab is removed. So this basically follows along that, that same picture. Scour progresses upstream and, and fails. Scour at the toe of the monolith initiates, intervention fails, and then it undermines the monolith. So there's a lot of different nodes, but the initiation of erosion is where we can use our erodibility index. So based on the different flood events that you have, the hydraulic person will say, um, for this 500-year flood, this is how much flow you've got going through your spillway. And there's a certain stream power associated with that. So this all comes from Annandale's Scour Technology um, book. And you, so for quantitative risk assessment, like we were doing here, we want to look at many different flood events. Uh, maybe we start at the 500 year and then we go out to the one in a million, the PMF or whatever that is. And each of those has an associated stream power. And so we compare each associated stream power with our erodibility index. Um, and if our stream power exceeds the erodibility index, then you have 100% likelihood of er initiating erosion. Okay, so if you don't, then maybe you don't in it. So you have to, that can help you determine at what level of flood event you're going to start eroding. Okay, so, and my key takeaway, since we're coming up on a half hour here, the erodibility index is really helpful for determining a flow threshold for initiation, but we are still left with this question in risk assessments on time dependence. How are we going to actually erode under the monolith? The erodibility index doesn't really help you that much with it because just because you initiate, do you have the duration and continued stream power to undermine that monolith and erode 10 feet of rock or whatever it is? That becomes a more qualitative assessment, but you can still use a lot of your background information from your site characterization to help inform that. Um, like, is this lower quality ashy tough continuous? Do you have these release planes and things like that? Um, so I do want to capitalize on all of the available original construction documentation, photos, et cetera, that you have. Um, I think that's all I have for this presentation, unless you guys have any questions. Hey, Erica, it's Susie. Thanks a lot. That was a really great presentation on Foster. Does anybody have any questions for Erica? Yeah, go ahead. Let me, let me hand you the highest.
Thank you. Um, I have a question, um, a couple. Uh, why wasn't a boring place within the shear zone? Yeah, that's a good question, but we logistically didn't have necessarily the space, but we also weren't really targeting the shear zone because we were considering that to be a release plane for for one of these monoliths to slide, but it wasn't the material that we were going to be actively eroding, and we, it wasn't exactly what we were trying to characterize for strength. Okay. Um, and what's the reasoning behind using PQ core, and did you use triple tube? Oh, well, you may be beyond my <laughs> drilling experience with that question, but the PQ core was because we did want a larger size diameter to get better lab results from the testing. Um, I don't know what a triple, I don't know what, what the other question was. Sorry, Erica, I'm taking the mic back. Hang on. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, um, triple tube is just um, an inner inner barrel within the core barrel that looks very much like okay. a split spoon sampler. And um, you, uh, when well. you take out the core, you push it out with water, and then you lift off that half of the um, sample. And, or covering, and that allows you to have um, a better representation of the core with less fracturing. All right, Erica. Well, thank you very much. We miss you this week. Hope you're having fun in, uh, I think, Washington. Well, thank you. I appreciated coming on. So have a good rest of your week.